that is where I want to be right now, just going down there. Gnarly. <laughs> what, down to a pehu? Yeah. You can't be serious, Chelsea. That's an active volcano. Well, actually, Polder, I am serious, because people do it all the time. It's not necessarily that dangerous, does that I mean it's not going to erupt anytime soon? What is our most dangerous volcano? I believe that uh, White Island is the biggest volcano in New Zealand. Yeah, but just because it's the biggest doesn't necessarily mean it's the most dangerous volcano. This is New Zealand's biggest volcano. How is that a volcano? It's referred to as a caldera. The Taupo caldera has erupted repeatedly, very violently, and it's just thrown enormous amounts of material out uh, onto the surface of the earth. But in so doing, it's been so explosive, it's literally created a hole, and then the sides of uh, this hole have collapsed back in on itself. So a caldera, when it erupts, does it just, does it like a mess and gush of lava just come out from the entire lake? Uh, well, not the entire lake, okay? Now, the last eruption was centered just here. So that 1,800 years ago, that was the event that produced the last Taupo eruption. The oh. biggest eruption we know of was actually from this part of the lake and here, and that was 26,500 years ago. Wow. It's very important that people understand just how dangerous Taupo is. You know, this, this is rated as perhaps the most violent volcano on the Earth today, and it has been this violent for the last 5,000 years. So not just so in New Zealand, in the whole globally, world? Globally, this is a very important volcano. Do people come from overseas to study it and stuff? Yeah, and for, sh for certain. This, this, this attracts volcanologists. Every volcanologist in the world will have been come here. here. They will have been here already. It's so explosive. This big cloud represents the really big eruption 26,500 years ago, compared to the last eruption of Mount Ruapehu, which is oh my goodness. more or less insignificant. By the way, the eruption column would have been about 50 kilometers high. Can you imagine? That would probably be several kilometers wide. It just goes straight up into the atmosphere get material cascading down the sides. Did they see it in like Australia and stuff? Did it affect? Oh yeah, the, the atmosphere was globally was affected. The Taupo was recorded quite by accident in China, uh, in Rome and Greece. We know exactly when it occurred because we've got ash in ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica and we can date it. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> Imagine having to live in a place this dark with no sunlight or anything. It's pitch black, always. I don't think you could, could you? Because no. like plants and stuff need sunlight to live, and then herbivores need the plants, and then carnivores need the yeah. herbivores, and everyone would just die. No, it? but what about all the creatures that live at the bottom of the sea? Because they don't have sunlight. But that works the same way, because the plankton gets the sunlight, and then fish eat the plankton, and then the fish at the bottom of the sea eat those fish. I'm not so sure about that, Tessa. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. When can we next expect a little visit from our eruption friend here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we simply don't know. But given that there were 28 eruptions in the last 26,000, that's on average one every 900 years. And the last eruption was 1,800 years ago. Maybe you could say we're overdue. However, we do know <laughs> the biggest gap between eruptions that we know of is about 5,000 years. So it is irregular. Okay. Thank goodness. So it could go off any but, day. That's right, could go off any day. Do, do we have any kind of warning system? We're actually monitoring all New Zealand's active volcanoes. And we do so in three ways. We're listening seismically and we're watching to see if the land surface is changing in any way. And we're also analyzing for chemical change. So any fluids associated with any volcano, we're watching them. You know, if there's an increase in carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide, we want to know about that, because those are the substances that come off first and eruptions on its way. But what we don't quite know 
is just how much time, lead time, we'll get. So if we were to find out that there was some changes and there was some sulphur coming up into the air, mm. what, what could we do, really? I mean, well, this is, you know, we have a whole ministry of emergency management and civil defence. So it is their role to translate scientific information. To the public. At what point do they tell the public to move? That's their problem. You don't have anything to do with that. I personally don't, no. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> we have the easy job. I'm so scared. I think we need some positive news. It's all right, kids. It all sounds a bit depressing. Is there any good news you can tell us about volcanoes? Yeah, don't be depressed, Tessa, <laughs> honestly. The volcanoes are actually wonderful when you think about it because they provide so much nutrient for uh, our soils. Take Taranaki, for instance, that erupts on average about every 200, 250 years. That is now regarded as one of the major reasons why the Waikato is so fertile. So when it erupts, you get this lovely ash scattered over the landscape. And uh, it gets as, Taranaki gets as far as Auckland, by the way. And just think of Auckland itself. You can grow almost anything in Auckland. There it is, Auckland City, developed on top of an active volcanic field with 49 volcanoes that have erupted all within the last 150,000 years. They're beautiful things to look at. I think volcanoes are wonderful, and we humans have learned to live with them. And when they start erupting, we, we watch and we move away. Shed some light on the subject. Oh, <laughs> nice one, Charles. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> I was talking the other week when Barnaby and I went to see Dr. Ashley Rowden, and he showed us these mussels that are like this long, like 30 centimetres long, and they live at the bottom of the ocean, deep, 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 deep down, and live not off the sun, but off like volcanic vents. So there you go. <laughs> Disco! <laughs> This diagram shows how volcanoes work, basically, and you can see, as I said before, that they're really uh, like a natural chimney. So there's a heat source down here, and the lava, magma, it's called magma underground, uh, rising up, and it becomes, it's referred to as lava once it get, reaches the surface. So where does all the heat source come from? Ah, the heat. Would you believe all the heat energy driving all the Earth's volcanoes is considered to be nuclear? So it's actually generated by normal radioactive breakdown of, uh, of radiogenic elements. And the principal elements are uranium, potassium, thorium, radium. So would a volcanic eruption with all its nuclear energy uh, have a similar effect to a nuclear power plant meltdown? It, it really wouldn't because, because the, the radioactive uh, materials are just evenly spread right through the rock. Uh, so they're not and the point about a nuclear power station is that you've got a, it's all terribly concentrated. Uranium and potassium are actually quite common element, rock forming elements. This diagram also shows why we have volcanoes in the centre of the North Island. So it's all to do with subduction of the Pacific plate beneath the Australian plate. And you can't suck down vast amounts of, uh, of one plate and take it back down into the earth without all the volatile material wanting to come back up. Because as you go into the Earth, temperature increases about 25 degrees per kilometre. Oh. You don't have to go too far down, it's really hot. I was just wondering, how deep is the deepest hole we've ever Well, I think done. the deepest hole is about 15 kilometres. So probably like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, negligible. Only Ruamoko, the volcano god, knows what it's like deep down under the Earth. If you and your team of scientists found out that Lake Topol was about to erupt any day, what would you do? I'd be moving. It depends on the, on the volcano. The higher the silicon content of the magma, the more explosive it will be. So that's a, a really good key. Now basalt uh, volcanoes are pretty low in silicon, and those you could go and watch. That's why people can go to Hawaii and watch the lava flowing down the hill and be within literally just a few metres of it. It's not very gassy, and it just flows out like some viscous molten liquid. But you get Taupo with more than 72% silica and you're in trouble. You're now dealing with a very sticky lava and it's very gas rich and extremely explosive. I wouldn't get too concerned if there was a, a, a volcano erupting in Auckland. I'd probably even go up and watch it. <laughs> but I certainly wouldn't go near Taupo. 
so look, I found this. Look, it looks like jellyfish exploding. Wow. <laughs> and then sitting on fire. But it's actually lava. Me and Boulder found out some real cool stuff while we were talking to Hamish. And um, Barney, it turns out that our biggest, most dangerous volcano is actually Taupo. I thought that was a lake. Well, actually, a caldera, to be specific. What's a caldera? What, you, you don't know what a caldera is? Polder didn't know either. It's a big volcano that when it explodes, it explodes so quickly that it leaves a big crater in the ground and that's how Taupo was created. Oh, and it filled up with water. Yeah. But White Island is still the most active volcano. Well, no one really knows because at any time, any time at all, Taupo could just jump up and explode.